And now, for a different perspective on the Bush administration's faith-based initiatives, we turn to Salon.com senior writer Michelle Goldberg. She's the author of Kingdom Coming, The Rise of Christian Nationalism. In it, she argues in favor of the separation of church and state. She also argues that many conservative religious leaders and organizations are working to make the U.S. overtly Christian. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for letting me come and speak at your church, which means a lot to me because one of the things that I try to show in Kingdom Coming is that the battles over religion and politics in this country aren't fights between kind of God-hating secularists on the one hand and the faithful on the other. They're fights between, in many cases, different kinds of believers, um, and it's fundamentally about whether or not you believe in separation of church and state and whether or not you believe um, that one faith should kind of predominate in American politics. And so to kind of have that message, um, to see kind of, you know, spiritual people being so um, enthusiastic about that message is really important to me. The book, Kingdom, the book is called Kingdom Coming, The Rise of Christian Nationalism. And it's about what I would, what I describe as a movement, in many cases really a political movement more than a religious movement. A political movement that wants, that sees separation of church and state as a lie, that believes America was founded as a Christian nation, and that wants to re-Christianize all of the institutions of American government and society. And I want to start out by um, separating Christian nationalism from evangelical Christianity or even fundamentalist Christianity because they're not the same thing. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of Americans are evangelicals. And I'm certainly not trying to um, speak of all of them when I talk about Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, you can probably estimate it at somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the population. There are people who usually say in surveys that Christianity should be made the official religion of the United States, that Christian politicians shouldn't um, compromise with people of other faiths when they're in office, and that, um, and that you know, various other groups, people, you know, homosexuals or religious minorities shouldn't be given the same rights as other Americans. And Christian nationalism, again, it's a political movement. You know, the Bible is, is silent on the way America should be governed. But to understand it, I'm going to have to um, try not to bore. Well, I'm going to have to try not to bore you with it, just a couple of quick definitions of fairly obscure terms. Um, and first, I want to talk about something called Christian Reconstructionism. And Christian Reconstructionism is a relatively not relatively. It's a very small sect. It is the most openly theocratic sect in American politics. They believe in you know, a complete Christian theocracy in, you know, turning the book of Leviticus into civil law, the execution of gay people, the execution of women who are unchaste before marriage, the execution of adulterers. Um, it was founded by a guy named R.J. Rushduni in um, the late 70s. Now, Christian Reconstructionism, again, is a small sect. It doesn't, it's rejected even by most um, fundamentalist Christian nationalists. But its political philosophy, it created a political theory about the way Christians should, or Christian nationalists should um, infiltrate the existing institutional order and kind of seize power. And it's um, this political theory, which is called dominionism, has had a great deal of influence within the larger Christian right, even people who don't subscribe to some of the harsher um, and more punitive tenets of Christian Reconstructionism. And actually, um, you know, I'm going to read you a quote from a book called The Changing of the Guard, Biblical Principles for Political Action, because, you know, I think that George Grant, a kind of proponent of Dominion theology, really explains it much better than I ever could. Now, George Grant used to be the executive director of D. James Kennedy's Coral Ridge Ministries, which is a major megachurch um, in Florida. You know, D. James Kennedy, he was recently inducted into the National Religious Broadcasters Hall of Fame. He's, although not as famous as Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, um, he's, he's right underneath them. So a very influential guy. 
George Grant worked for him. Now he writes for World Magazine, which is kind of like the Evangelical Newsweek. Um, and here's what he wrote. Christians have an obligation, a mandate, a commission, a holy responsibility to reclaim the land for Jesus Christ, to have dominion in civil structures, just as in every other aspect of life and godliness. But it is dominion we are after, not just a voice. It is dominion we are after, not just influence. It is dominion we are after, not just equal time. It is dominion we are after. World conquest, that's what Christ has commissioned us to accomplish. We must win the world with the power of the gospel, and we must never settle for anything less. Thus, Christian politics has, as its primary intent, the conquest of the land, of men, families, institutions, bureaucracies, courts, and governments for the kingdom of Christ. And so my book is really about the way that this um, political philosophy has been enacted. And one of the things I want to make clear is that I'm not arguing that America is on the cusp of a theocracy. Um, what I do see, rather, are theocratic elements um, slowly gaining traction, slowly changing our national life. Um, you know, it's a subtle process, sometimes an insidious process, um, and sometimes I think it's kind of hard to tell until a few years later you, you realize how has this happened in America? You know, things that we used to believe were impossible are becoming possible. And so first I'm going to talk just about the kind of movement and then about its practical consequences um, for real people because this is more than just a battle about, um, you know, national ideals or religious symbolism or whether or not we're going to have prayer in schools, although all those things are important. It's actually changing the way real people's lives are lived. Um, now, Christian reconstruction, or I'm sorry, Christian nationalism, um, in many cases, it's more than just a, it's more than just that it um, espouses different ideas or you know conservative ideas about things like gay marriage or abortion or these other hot but button political issues. I really see it as creating an entire alternative reality, an entire kind of parallel culture, and so. You have, and we talked about this um, a little bit earlier, you have, you know, obviously the most famous is intelligent design and creationism. And so you can study creationism from, you know, kind of preschool through, you can get your graduate degree now at many of these u universities in creationist astrophysics. And there will, they'll soon next year be opening up a um, really state-of-the-art creationist science museum in Cincinnati where you can go to the planetarium and learn how starlight traveled only 6,000 years to reach the Earth and how um, human beings would ride um, triceratops through the ancient world. And so, but what I think is interesting about this museum, it's not the first creationist museum, but it's definitely the slickest. And so increasingly, I think you're seeing this other culture, this parallel culture mimicking all of the institutions of, of, of our culture, of our reality, of what we think of as reality, um, and kind of duplicating them according to this Christian nationalist ideology. And you also see it with history. This movement is very dependent on a kind of revisionist history of America in which the founders were conservative Christians, in which they never intended to separate church and state, and in which the First Amendment was only intended to stop the government from preferring any Christian sect over any other Christian sect. And so, again, I often find the people um, in this movement, you know, can kind of explain their views better than I can. And so I'm just going to read a quote from the Family Research Council, which is a major um, lobbying organization in D.C. in constant touch with both the White House and the congressional leadership. And as I'll show, I think one of the main conduits that links this broader movement to the Republican Party. And so this was a statement that they put out after a Hindu priest was invited to give the invocation before Congress. Um, they wrote, while it is true that the United States of America was founded on the sacred principle of religious freedom for all, that liberty was never intended to exalt other religions to the level that Christianity